Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, and this is Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. I was the head coach of the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we were fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. This show is based on my books, Beyond the Lines and Beyond the Game, and it's about leadership, character, and creating a superior culture of excellence. My special guest today is the former president and CEO of the Better Business Bureau of Hawaii. And he is the current president and CEO of the iconic Hawaii theater in downtown Honolulu. He is Gregory Dunn. And today we are going beyond entertainment. Hey, Greg, welcome to Beyond the Lines. Aloha, Rusty. Thank you. So good to see you, Greg. And you know, we are so lucky to have you as the leader of our Hawaii theater. And I know that you're so excited now because it's officially reopened. And can you tell us about some of the upcoming events that you guys have scheduled? Well, it's been a brutal 20 months for us to say the least. And now the, the, the light that was shining at the end of the tunnel has become something other than a train coming at us head on. Uh, we now have a, a phenomenal lineup of shows uh, coming up. Uh, this week, we have a, a group called Crossing Rain that we're really excited about. Uh, it is Hawaii's boy band. So a group of, of young adults have gotten together, and they're going to be performing live on our stage with an in-person full capacity audience. So for us, full capacity is having up to 1,400 of the seats filled. So we're really excited to welcome the, the guys in. We also have a Christmas special coming up, uh, Makaha Kalikimaka. Uh, and then over Thanksgiving weekend, Ronnie Chen, national, international comedian, movie star, is going to be on stage two nights, Friday and Saturday, uh, to say the least. And, and then we go into December, January, February. Uh, you know, the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra is now the company in residence and artistic partners at the Historic Hawaii Theater. So we'll have the majority of the symphony performing at the theater over the course of the next several months. Well, Ronnie is going to be absolutely hilarious. <laughs> I mean, he, well, we've sold out one of his shows already. We added a second because of demand. Well, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you guys have to add a third show for him, right? We're crossing our fingers. It's like the... <laughs> It's like the sold out shows help us to raise money to keep the theater open. You know, that's been one of the things with with stepping into uh, running the, the historic Hawaii theater has been trying to figure out how do we get the theater to be able to survive absent any state or city and county support to run the operations of the theater uh, when, you know, in a competitive landscape, the theater has to compete with publicly subsidized venues like the Blaisdell centers and the Waikiki shell. Uh, we, we simply don't have the, the largesse of the of state government covering our capital expenditures. Uh, we have to earn the money and raise the money to keep the theater open. Greg, tell me a bit about the history of the Hawaii Theater. Well, the Hawaii Theater was uh, built by Consolidated Amusements and opened in September of 1922, uh, which is a shameless plug. We're heading into our 100th season of operations in the state of Hawaii. So as uh, the Consolidated Amusements built the theater as both a vaudeville house and as a movie house. So for opening night, the theater uh, was slated to uh, film and screen Three Musketeers. Unfortunately, on opening night, the people packed into the house, but the movie was still sitting offshore on a boat trying to come into the harbor. They couldn't get the movie in. So instead they had a, a local opera star uh, stand on stage and sing for folks. And they did more of a, a vaudeville style production as the opening for the theater. And over the course of its life, as it transitioned into a movie house in the 1940s, you can see that uh, the theater had first run programs. Uh, at the time it seated 1800 people. So it was one of the largest theaters in the state. And during the wartime, it was a favorite spot in Chinatown for the GIs to stop in who didn't want to visit the, the, uh, the more surly and, and seedy areas of, of Hotel Street. They would come to the Hawaii Theater and enjoy a show. No, that's really interesting hearing about, you know, the background of how it all began and wow, coming up on that 100th anniversary. And Greg, what, what is the mission of the Hawaii Theater? 
Well, as we have today, the Historic Hawaii Theater is, uh, is owned and operated by a nonprofit corporation. So a private corporation with a board of directors that oversees the nonprofit assets of the theater. The mission is to preserve and maintain the historic property, as well as to promote Hawaiian arts and culture and provide a safe space for people to perform uh, multidisciplinary arts programs. And then to also act as an economic incubator to help promote Chinatown Arts and Culture District. So by bringing in 1,400 people to enjoy the theater uh, every show on a weekend, we help raise the economic profile of Chinatown. We help support hundreds of small mom, mom and pop shops and restaurants and bars that are in the neighborhood. And it's, it's, it's wonderful to be part of the fabric of a tight knit historic community. And the, the historic Hawaii theater works to do that. Yeah, I can see it. It definitely creates a, all these effects where it's a win-win-win situation with all the businesses around there that you just mentioned. And Greg, the interior of the Hawaii Theater is absolutely beautiful. And you guys run such a diverse range of entertainment. I mean, I've, I've been there for concerts. I've been there for pageants, comedy shows. I mean, that, doesn't that get you excited because you get to see it all, right? Well, I get to see it all, and it makes me also uh, one of the, the most uh, critical guests at other functions because, you know, we, at, at the Hawaii Theater, we, we have this beautiful interior that, that was restored in, when the theater opened in 1996. So Sarah Richards led the effort to raise over $32 million that allowed the nonprofit corporation to purchase the Hawaii Theater and then restore the interior of it. Uh, some of the, this is one of the finest examples of this type of architecture that still exists in the state. Most of the theaters around the state have already been torn down. Uh, we have a couple of other historic venues, but none is as grand as the historic white theater. So Greg, how, so can you talk more about how the theater is funded and, and how ordinary average people can help donate? Well, the theater is, is funded by contributions from donors, as well as ticket sales and the ticketing fees that we have. We receive some uh, grants from the city or from the city and the state for programs and projects, but we rely generally on the donations of the general public. So uh, during COVID, we received a, a small portion of our operating income from grants. But over $800,000 of our $1.2 million operating budget during the, the COVID period was supported by donors who went to hawaiitheater.com. Uh, it's T-R-E, so hawaiitheater.com, and went to our donate page and clicked in and, and helped support us both with one-time gifts and also with recurring donations. So people setting up a five or a 10 or a $20 monthly gift that would process automatically and go to support the theater and help to, to ensure that community groups uh, like the ones that you mentioned, the, the halals and the, the folks that are putting on the, the pageants and the school groups that wanna use the theater are able to do so affordably. Nice, that, that sounds really good. And and Greg, I notice when I drive by or I'm walking by there, I notice that there's various messages that people can actually put up there. How, how does that work? So as, as part of a challenge grant that we received from the Historic Hawaii Foundation and the Freeman Family Foundation to help uh, repair and restore the neon sign that's on the, the front of the building, our marquee, we came up with a program called Marquee Messages. So we wanted to give people the ability to send a congratulatory wish of say a birthday or a thank you for someone's community service or some other way in which people could celebrate a, a, you know, a, a marriage proposal we've had and even a gender reveal for a baby. People are able to do that. You can find out more information on our website under the Marquee Messages uh, portion and you too could help uh, give someone some, some bright light in their life by supporting the Historic Hawaii Theater for a $150 gift. You can get your message on the marquee all day. We do have some fine print that says, uh, you know, obviously we, we can't do anything that's commercial in nature. Uh, it can only be congratulatory and something that, that sends someone well wishes, but we can't promote a service or a product on the, on the marquee. 
we'd like to keep it in, in line with our mission. Well, Greg, that, that's such a great idea that you came up with. And, and you came up with that idea, right? Knowing you. Yeah, <laughs> a little bit of marketing <laughs> background never, never hurts anyone. <laughs> oh, that, that's absolutely terrific. And Greg, what are, what are some of your goals for the Hawaii theater moving forward? Well, we, we have several large goals. I mean, one is the, the theater itself is, has been through a, a, a very difficult period operationally. Um, we, we made some very drastic staffing decisions and cuts. Uh, Pre-COVID, the theater had over 50 staff people. We wound up laying most of those people off during the pandemic. Uh, and so we, we operated and ran the theater with a staff of three people during COVID. We've now doubled our staff, we're up to six. So we're working our way up incrementally. Uh, and, but it, it's also given us an opportunity to look at our business model and say, for the type of organization we wanna be going forward, one that does both in-person shows and a mix of digital content broadcasting, what type of people do we need to support those mission-driven activities? So we'll, we'll look at that. We also need to take head on some deferred maintenance and uh, issues that, that we've had. One of the things that the theater has suffered from over the years is, is really a lack of general funding and support to uh, maintain the facility. A great deal of money was put into, into place uh, early on. And now, unfortunately, the money stopped when the capital campaign was over. But with a very old facility, we have millions of dollars of deferred maintenance that needs to be addressed. Uh, the, the next big one is uh, taking care of spalling on the concrete structure which is uh, you know, digging out the rusting rebar in the concrete, repacking the concrete, replastering the outside of the theater and then painting it. So we have both uh, you know, mission challenges and we have hardcore physical challenges we have to deal with. Oh, that's a lot of stuff to do, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> and there's six of us. <laughs> <laughs> now, Greg, you, you have my books and I want to ask you about leadership because, sure. I mean, you're a, a, such a successful leader. What, do you, what are some key things that you feel the best leaders do? Uh, you, you know, one of the simplest things is listen. I think that, you know, one, and it's one of the things that you talk about is there's an inverse relationship between the, the number of ears you have and the mouth you have. Uh, so good leaders listen much more than they speak. Uh, and the same, you, you have two eyes, so you should read more than you, than you talk. Uh, you know, and, and I think that, that ultimately in building organizations, um, one of my, my, my favorite concepts that I've read comes from Stephen M. R. Covey. Uh, and that's called in, in his book, The Speed of Trust. It talks about building trust within teams and how you get your team members to trust each other. Because when you, you as you're bringing people together, everyone naturally has a very competitive edge. I mean, we, you and I both love tennis. We, we, you know, we have that in common. We know how competitive tennis players can be. And then when you get into a doubles environment, you're taking this very singular game and you're putting a team aspect into it and trying to get people to play as a team. And that the teamwork only really comes when people trust each other and they know that people are going to do what they say and, and they're going to follow up and you can count on them. And so for me, building a, a, an environment where people can trust each other, they can trust that when they want to bring something up, they can do so safely without fear of retaliation or retribution or, or being belittled for the type of, of comment or suggestion they want to bring up through maintaining their self-esteem and but, you know, it also requires you to set ground rules and, and have very clear expectations of what is appropriate communication, what, you know, what are, what's our language going to be as a group. So the, those are, are, are just the basic tenets that, that I think are critical as you're looking to build teams and, and uh, uh, to be a, a manager that, that can provide successful results. Because one of the things that, that many of us know, we all have a lot of trophies on our shelves, but those are just awards for what happened before. You know, we're, we're only good as what our performance is on game day every day going forward. Well, Greg, I like that you mentioned about listening and trust and you touched a little bit on, on communication. And you know, in my book, I talk about how I give honest feedback. I don't give good mm -hmm. feedback or bad feedback. I give honest feedback. And 
How are you? Are you similar in that way? Where when you're leading your team members, you give them a lot of honest feedback as well. Yeah, absolutely. And we we also encourage um, feedback uh, cross cross team. So we'll have opportunities where we sit down and we we have a debrief. So, uh, for example, we just finished our our first live programs with the Hawaii Symphony Orchestra in-house. And we brought together the symphony staff and the Hawaii theater staff. We sat down, we had a meeting to talk about what worked, what we could improve, and what really didn't work that we needed to get rid of. And, and being able to then establish with people that this is the feedback that we all need to be comfortable giving. We need to take notes and say, These are, this was my perception of, of what worked and what didn't work. And, and then listen to what, everyone else's perceptions are and and to do so in a supportive and and friendly environment uh, but then when we have to give the the real critical um you know results and say hey, look this is where your your performance failed to live up to what our expectations are well, we have very frank conversations about it and and hold people accountable to what the ground rules are it's uh you know and it very much is in tennis if if the ball is outside the line, it's outside the line. It's like, <laughs> yeah, in is in and out is out. <laughs> exactly. It's like, and there and there's no computerized replay to 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 help determine the the gray line. It's like for us, it's either in or it's out. It's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right about you know the open communication and and the importance of having open communication go both ways and. Greg, how, how would you describe your leadership style? Wow, well, that's a tough one. Um, you know, the, <laughs> um, I think that it's, it's, it's a good mixture of, of caring, but also so firm and, and setting very clear expectations. Um, I think that, you know, when, when we're in a, a, a customer focused operation, we, we have to ensure that everything that we're doing um, generates a wonderful experience for our patrons because we we live on repeat business and your cost to acquire a new customer um, when you've turned off an old one is very high. So your cost to maintain existing customers is much lower. And the way we do that is by setting clear expectations that we give outstanding experiences to patrons every day, all the time. And when we don't, that's when we we fall down on our, our brand promise and our delivery to the patrons. So for us, it's very critical to constantly ensure that that our our corporate culture is one that is in line with with what we want to do and also in line with my management style and supporting you know excellence all the time, investing in the staff, providing good feedback, but also being caring and understanding um, as a person and making sure that that we recognize that people have off days and you know we don't we don't throw them off the team just because they've had an off day when we talk about what we can do to to help improve their performance in in the next go around you don't throw them off the team <laughs> <laughs> i'm not i'm not as as hard charging of a coach as you were right <laughs> Now, Greg, you know, when you're leading teams, what's the biggest thing when, you know, with your employees that just absolutely drives you nuts that they do sometimes? You know, so, some of the best feedback that I received um, in my career came from my old boss at, at Nike. Uh, so Mike Ramos, uh, and you might know him, he's a, a, a storage volleyball coach in Hawaii. I mean, really phenomenal. And, and coming in when I, when I worked at Nike, one of the things that, that we were always challenged with is that with the type of, of management structure at Nike, you're always looking for the best, you want the best. And so they're, they're always looking for A-flight players. And Mike's, Mike's philosophy was, you know, what you really wanna do is find the B and C-flight players with potential. You wanna find people with potential that are driven and are hungry and you can mentor and develop them and have them grow to be successful. So by by taking that 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 thought of his and, and that, you know, that internal drive to say, we want to find people that are driven. We want to find people that, that are looking to, to step up and move up and develop themselves. 
when I see that in 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 our players and our and in our, our team within the theater, it, that drives me and makes me really uh, really excited and really happy because we're developing people, we're helping them move and improve uh, in their careers. What drives me crazy is people that don't have to drive. So I'm sorry, it's a long way of getting around, but there's you know. So when I see people that don't have drive and they just want to show up and they. they they, they just want to collect a paycheck and they're not delivering outstanding service. They're, they're not contributing to the mission of the organization. Um, you know, it's like, look, if you want to be somewhere else, choose to be somewhere else. That's okay. It's like, we'll, we'll be just fine. And the theater will, will be fine without you um, or whatever team you're on will be fine without you. But it's, it, then it puts us in a position where we have to help people make decisions about where they want to be in their lives. And many times that's one of the things that, that is causing them to feel like they're dissatisfied in their, their present uh, occupational pursuit is they really haven't found that thing that drives them or they haven't found the passion that helps to fulfill them in their, um, in their career life. Oh, I, I love hearing that because you're right. It's, it's all about finding your passion. And, and, and that's what we, I'm trying to have everybody do by, you know, reading the books as well. And, and Greg, I want to ask you about when you were president and CEO of the Better Business Bureau of Hawaii, what were some of the challenges that you were dealing with uh, with the BBB? You know, the BBB was a, a, a multifaceted organization. Uh, the, Hawaii, um, the Hawaii BBB was an independent corporation uh, that operated under the principles of, of, a, of a international uh, association of better business bureaus. So, you know, we, you had internal struggles constantly about how to how to to guide and judge what uh, were allowable standards within the business community. Um, it was a real challenge to to help all of the small businesses in the state recognize that they needed to stand up to to the the principles the BBB held as as ones that were required for accreditation. Um, which were, you know, to play fair and be honest and, and make sure that they were treating customers well and providing customers with an opportunity to provide feedback if they, if they felt that the company was, was not um, handling their, their complaints or their uh, customer challenges well. You know, so I think that the educational aspect of working with thousands of small businesses around the state and even some large ones. You know, some of the, the biggest complaints we had were, were large corporations that, that felt like, well, you know, we don't need to, to follow the rules. You know, we're, we're this company and we're the biggest and we're the best and, and you know, people, you know, forget. Uh, and then, you know, from a, a, a business development standpoint, one of the biggest challenges was how do you take a legacy brand like the Better Business Bureau and bring it into the 21st century where it's a much more digital age and your, your challenge is to, to help the association understand um, that people have changed around them, how they get information and, and, and view content is different than what it was 25 years ago. Uh, consumers uh, engage with businesses in a different way than they did 25 years ago. So the, um, structurally, the Better Business Bureau had to change to meet the needs of today's consumers. And that, and that was a, another entirely different challenge. No, that, that makes sense. I love hearing these insights. And Greg, when you were the leader of the BBB, what are, and you made some real significant improvements there. What are some of those improvements that you're most proud of? Well, I think the, the biggest improvement that I, I'm the most proud of was the redesign and, and development of the BBB's global website. Um, I was on the, uh, the operating committee for the International Better Business Bureau. So that involved me going to Washington DC at least once a month and being a part of the team meetings that oversaw um, the development, the design, the review. We, um, you know, it was some of the most um, interesting work in my career to have to, to step up and learn uh, what the latest trends like technology, uh, consumer um, behaviors and, and consumer desires and what kind of information they wanted and how they wanted to receive it. Um, it. I think that it helped set me up for a more successful transition into the Hawaii theater where we wound up taking the Hawaii theater uh, to a, a, a fully digital platform relatively quickly from 2017 through 2019 
we developed a, a ticketing platform and uh, and then that provided us the ability to transition into the um, the digital broadcasts that we had during COVID and it helped us to survive. So when we, we think about uh, all of those trips to DC and the things that happened at the Better Business Bureau, it all carries forward. You know, you're, you're constantly improving your game as you go. And uh, it's, it was a tremendous period in my life. And, and I, I, miss the, uh, I, I miss the work at the Better Business Bureau, but I'm glad that it, it's continuing under the leadership of the BBB of the Pacific. We're really fortunate to have uh, been able to merge the local Better Business Bureau in with the regional entity that ensured it would survive. Well, you're a def you're definitely a well-rounded leader, you, you know, knowing all of these things that you know, Greg. And I want to ask you, whether it's professionally or personally, what's a big adversity that you dealt with in your life so far? Oh boy, that's a the the wow, boy, you really have stumbled me on that one. Um, I think the biggest adversity that I have to deal with is is recognizing the importance of balance between the work life and the personal life. Um, there, as executives, we have so many demands on our time. Um, there, we have personal family demands, we have career demands, we have the, the work that's in front of us today. Um, we have this, this easy access to communication and information. So in, in the course of a day, I have to field messages from email, text message, um, Facebook messenger, Instagram messenger, um, you know, all these multiple ways that people, and oh, and the telephone, this still works. People can still pick up the telephone and call you. So, so how do you balance the time of all of the people that want to connect with you and talk with you and share information and potentially do business with you uh, with, with the reality of how much time you have? You know, many of us will, will work all day long and then we'll go, go home and have dinner and we'll work several hours at night while we're sitting on the computer and you know the laptop makes it you know feasible for us to do that until 11 o'clock at night and we go to bed and then we realize oh my gosh I didn't do anything for myself today I didn't go to the gym I didn't go and play tennis I didn't go to the beach I didn't enjoy this beautiful state that that we live in and I think that for me that's been one of the challenges in in having consistently driven high performance expectation positions is the that you know we all have to set expectations of what we're going to do for ourselves and scheduling in going to the gym scheduling in the days that we're going to play tennis scheduling in when we can take trips and vacation that's like those are the the things that i've been the most challenged with oh i i like that you shared that greg because yeah it's all about balance and and really taking care of your health and having really good stress relief too because you know, I, I know that you have 36 hour days. I mean, we only have 24, you got 36. Yeah. I, I know how busy you are and you find a way to get all these things done. But Greg, you know, you're, I, I feel so great that we were able to get you on the show today to really talk about Hawaii theater and then really about leadership and, and creating this culture of excellence that you have done. And I really want to thank you for taking time to be on the show today. Thank you, Rusty, and thank you for everything you do for the community. Your, your book program and getting the books into the schools and, and helping to create a community of readers that care and understand how to become good leaders themselves, I think it is very admirable. You should be very pleased with the results. I'm gonna keep moving forward with that. Thank you, Greg. Okay, thanks, Rusty. And thank you for watching Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. For more information, please visit rustykomori.com and my books are available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. I hope that Greg and I will inspire you to create your own superior culture of excellence and to find your greatness and help others find theirs. Aloha.